first, um, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks. How are you, Blake? Good. So tell me a little bit about yourself um, and yeah, who you are and, and what you've been doing. Yes, I'm. Um, thanks for having me. First of all, it's uh, it's a great pleasure to talk about uh, such a hot topic uh, lately. Um, I'm an architect, and uh, I also do uh, some industrial design. And uh, my involvement, my engagement with uh, Hyperloop, my involvement into a Hyperloop project started in 2015. Um, after uh, Elon published uh, his uh, alpha paper. Mm -hmm. So I took a read and uh, I was really, you know, hooked by mm -hmm. uh, how amazingly interesting should be, uh, it should be to design uh, and, you know, compose and propose my vision um, for, uh, for Hyperloop. And also yeah. by potential impact that it can create, uh, uh, it can pose into, you know, mm -hmm. transportation and uh, how our world actually operates. So I was definitely, I had no doubts about uh, uh, joining the competition that was announced uh, mm -hmm. a little bit later in 2015 and then uh, in 2016 in the beginning, uh, it was the results were published and I got into semifinals and uh, had a chance to present my project to wider um, audience. Mm -hmm. And that's probably how you got to know about me yeah. and I got to know about you and that's why we talk. So very good. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Well, uh, this, is, this is a real honor because I've never seen such beautiful uh schematics, drawings, visions of what the Hyperloop will actually look like in uh, a city or, you know, in, with actual hardware. And I see you do have hardware right in front of you. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, that's true. That's uh, that's model for the pod that was uh, done and printed uh, for three to printed for uh, for the design weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, got some positive feedback and uh, I wanted to show it to you uh, a little bit later in detail. So if you allow me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, how do you go about uh, first thinking about, you know, how to design these these big projects? Uh, where do you where do you kind of start? Um, yeah, that's that's a good question, because, uh, you know, right now uh, it goes with uh, pure enthusiasm, you know, mm -hmm. Um, such work is usually done by uh, large entities uh, mm -hmm. and big firms where there are many people. Uh, but, you know, I was so interested that I, uh, you know, it took me uh, a little bit of energy just to do it all myself. Uh, like I could not resist uh, because this is really uh, something new in terms of typology, whether it's an architecture or a... Uh, industrial design objects such as this pod. It's a new typology and it is rarely uh, such chance um, that you can, you know, touch some oncoming revolution in, uh, in, in transportation and in, in the way world is designed mm -hmm. and manufactured around us. And, and I always ask this question, <laughs> where would you like to go in a Hyperloop? Uh, what cities would this connect if, if you could build a Hyperloop anywhere on Earth? Yeah, I believe that, you know, uh, that should be interesting, uh, you know, riding between any kind of cities, of course. Oh. But if to be realistic, I think that uh, the system should first uh, be tried out and uh, proven uh, mm -hmm. with a frayed uh, application, you know, because... Uh, um, where largest freight flow is in the world, uh, between what metropolitan areas it is, I believe it's that place where Hyperloop should be uh, implemented first. Mm. And primarily I talk about uh, China, you know, and uh, its largest, uh, you know, obviously the first, the first system is being 
invented, being designed right now in the U.S. And mm-hmm. uh, there's large, there's no, it's, it's, it's inevitable that the first system will be built and proven uh, in the U.S. And perhaps first routes will be connecting some uh, some cities in, in, in the States. But I believe that most demand is laying right now uh, at those countries that are involved in large you know, freight flows. Yeah. And that's why I'm mentioning China, mm-hmm. you know, and the largest seaports through which that freight flow is going uh, mm-hmm. are the areas and sites uh, which Hyperloop systems should first connect. I talk about Hong Kong, Chongqing, mm-hmm. Dalian, Guangzhou, uh, you know, Far East, uh, Southeast Asia, mm-hmm. Malaysia, Philippines, and uh, of course, Dubai, India. Yeah. Uh, the initiative was uh, actually proposed by Xi, Xi Jinping, this Silk uh, Silk Road Economic yes. Belt. Yeah, the, yeah. And um, uh, this is really, I mean, it's not, it's not just, it's not, I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. And, uh, you know, probably companies who are doing this system are, they do have their own vision where they should build it first. Mm-hmm. But I believe that uh, China, where everything is produced, India, uh, and uh, through the Silk Road economic belt connected to East Africa and then further to Europe and through mm-hmm. Russia, this mm-hmm. is probably uh, the most economically viable uh, route to be built first. You know, U.S. is actually, uh, I mean, I believe that like I said, freight should come first. And then within U.S., I see Hyperloop to be more of a, you know, part of a public transportation system. Yeah. And yeah. From that standpoint, I believe that should be a next step, you know, maybe a mm. second step once the system is totally proven. Because uh, the states are also cut off by oceans, right, mm-hmm. uh, from the rest of lands. And mm-hmm. until, you know, until underwater solution is established and proven, yeah. um, that becomes a far perspective. So maybe uh, the United States, uh, they would be self-contained in terms of public transport and maybe some freight, uh, freight yeah. routes with Mexico uh, and uh, South America. But perhaps the most demand will be in, uh, in Asia. And I mean, I... I, this is kind of blowing my mind, <laughs> but I, I do see the logic. I see this. I see the vision, and to have all of this freight to go so fast, and to have kind of this on demand, it, it's exactly. really going to change a lot of things. Um, exactly. Yeah, just really mind mind blowing. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, perhaps uh, show me some of your drawings and your the fabulous artwork that I saw. Um, Yes, I will. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Let me let me give a brief introduction to yeah, uh, yeah. how I actually seen uh, the system should be designed. First mm-hmm. of all, I'm a firm, belie- I'm a firm believer in uh, in integrated design. I think that mm-hmm. uh, uh, a person who starts to work on such a project ha- has to try to come up with a coherent, cohesive vision for the mm-hmm. system, uh, for it to have a sort of a singular. Um, visual experience because you know that might be a unique chance it might be a very good chance because previously you know mm-hmm. the vehicles uh, vehicles are designed by someone and then buildings that receive these vehicles whether it's an airport or a train station they designed by someone else yeah. it's, it's good but then you know uh, the uh, it gives you some diversity but I wanted to try something that has a common design sense whether throughout the entire system, mm-hmm. starting from a uh, smart, smallest thing, which probably uh, is a furniture on your station, <laughs> like benches, uh, yeah. you know, some elevating systems or uh, leisure areas. And then B, which is the next step in, in, in the scale of things. And then all the way to the station and even maybe um, – urban applications and how you design urban areas that are surrounding surrounding your stations. So that was my goal to come up with uh, a singular visual experience for everything. And, uh, you know, the main, uh, the main thing that I wanted to focus on 
uh, was the user experience. And, uh, you know, Hyperloop, the idea of Hyperloop is not the most novel one, right? There were precedents and papers published uh, a long time ago, almost, uh, you know, a couple dozens of years ago. Yeah. Uh, but when you, I mean, it was applied in, in, in pneumatic in pneumatic mail, right, mm-hmm. deliveries. But when you really start to think about it, uh, from the point of it coming into real life, uh, you want to get as much amazing experience from it as you can, because it is really a celebration of travel. It's, it's an excitement, uh, when you use a forefront technology, uh, to move through your, uh, you know, futuristic cities that are, uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's my fi- favorite vision when you have yeah. your contemporary, uh, cities that, are filled with uh, skyscrapers, you know, downtowns, uh, highways, ultra modern ways of transporting, whether mm-hmm. it's a car, your, uh, you know, unmanned bus, mm-hmm. uh, Hyperloop among those, you know, mm-hmm. these tubes that are running along highways. This would be a pretty amazing spectacle, you know, yeah. vehicles becoming electric. It's no longer, you know, I believed that the main thing that 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 potential user should experience is that excitement um, from using a technology. And, uh, you know, it should be sometimes even, let's say, you know, impossible, something impossible in terms of your design vision, but then eventually you start working on it and Mm -hmm. you're finding ways to, uh, to implement it. Even though I try to be as grounded as possible in terms of, parts my architecture is designed from. Yeah. So uh, bottom line is that design has to be uh, futuristic. It has to inspire. Um, mm-hmm. It has to be formal. I also thought it has to be formal because, you know, uh, when you go to an airport, when you embarking in an airplane, it's white, it's shiny. Yeah. It's very, you know, it's optimistic feeling. You have you know, blue sky, white clouds. It's, I mean, there is a reason it is painted white and it actually in our minds associated with, uh, with that excitement of travel and technology. And I also wanted to create something that, that is, you know, user friendly. It is not simply a flying engine, uh, that you have to embark and, uh, probably older people and children would be scared. Uh, but I wanted to design something that is in the middle between, you know, uh, conventional high speed train, uh, airplane and this unmanned um, uh, autonomous capsule that flies through the tube. I mean, your, your your pod right in front of you, it's like a Concorde. It is what Elon Musk said. It's a Concorde, you know, with a sleek nose mixed with like a rail gun <laughs> because it's really long. And, you. you know, the air hockey table with the massive coil corkscrew air intake that's crazy i mean that's that is what i thought of the future i'm like that's very futuristic <laughs> yes thank you i mean uh, that's that derives from the fact that i you know put a lot of my free time into even though i formally <laughs> trained and educated as an architect i've put a lot of my free time into you know studying concepts in aerospace engineering because mm. that is really a pinnacle of human uh, thought uh and uh, you know everyone who's capable should try to learn from it or at least to become aware of what engineers are doing um, that would really enrich their mind way of thinking and design vision. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'd be glad to uh, share the screen and show some renderings. Please. Please. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh my goodness. That is so much light in that station. Yeah, thanks, Blake. That was the goal. So this is an introductory image, uh, and it, it shows the view of the interior from uh, from uh, the space where actually no people would be allowed to go into because that should be a safety area. But I put that image as as a mean of showing how vast actually the space should be, uh, because really. The idea that was, uh, you know, described in in Alpha paper that mm-hmm. there should be so many pods traveling traveling through through the station and the the rate of them being loaded and unloaded with passengers mm-hmm. um, and the rate of departure and arrivals is so frequent it's almost two pods in a single minute. Uh, it would require a lot of uh, 
space, a lot of, you know, platforms being spread out within the building. It would require a huge safety area uh, to which no people can access. Uh, and also a zone uh, that would provide a cushion, like, like, let's say, a safety zone that would, you know, mm-hmm. border people and passengers from equipment that deals with vacuum. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is the overall image where you can see that station uh, comprised of huge glass dome that covers the uh, the interior space and PV panels that produce large amount of its energy demand. Mm-hmm. And here you can see a uh, section of it and a little bit uh, more detailed oh, sections nice. where you can see uh, how system actually works. Uh, at the bottom image, which is a magnified image, mm-hmm. you can see that. Uh, passenger platforms are split in different levels. They're separated so you can uh, easily and efficiently ma- uh, manage uh, passenger flow uh, through your station. Um, they obviously cannot collide and they have to be totally separated, uh, which is uh, a solution I put a lot of attention into uh, as opposed to other projects. Uh, about the sta- about a hyperloop station that I've seen. So you basically enter into uh, your entrance zone on the right, where you can see check-in stands, and then mm-hmm. you proceed to uh, that huge gray uh, floor plate that would be a uh, a zone for uh, you know uh, rest and you know where you feel where you see uh, this amazing vast perspective of open space mm-hmm. under almost. Um, I'll tell it about. I'll tell about it a little bit later. Well, you see the timetables, yeah, uh, yeah. some coffee, and then you go through security, and eventually on the left you proceed to platforms, and you go down on escalators, and you embark those pods. Mm-hmm. And under that gray plate, you have a service block which is completely isolated from the rest of the station, where actually all the handling of pods uh, is happening, wow. where pods are unloaded of luggage. Uh, batteries changed, you know, they have a minute maintenance uh, that is requested uh, or required, and then they, uh, you know, put back in uh, the queue or evacuated from the queue. And obviously what what is located on the right under the check-in zone is, are the hangars, are the hangars where the pods are maintained. Uh, Right here, wow. you can see this vast, uh, this vast array of uh, PV panels, and uh, this is actually the view that I believe. Uh, that's actually the view where you can see this vast reserve for you know pressurization equipment, yeah. and uh, uh, I think it has to be partially submerged in landscape because when you deal with vacuum, it's uh, all things are explosive. You know, they have to be really separated uh, safety-wise from the rest of the station and actually from the city, from a city where uh, the building is uh, built. Um, uh, Here you can see this rail shift. I also believe that it's a very important consideration in terms of how you split, how you manage the pot flow. Like I said, they're going to, they will be arriving and departing so frequently Mm -hmm. that I believe there is no way to have any kind of mechanical application, uh, you know, uh, so sending them throughout the building. Yeah. I came up with the idea of of a simple rail ship that is robust, built out of concrete. Uh, there's little chance of jam. There's little chance of uh, malfunction. It's it's a very robust, simple, very simplistic system uh, that leaves little percent, little chance for failure. Uh, as opposed to mechanical systems that I've seen in other projects, which deal with revolving barrels, you know, no change in levels, yeah, yeah. like that. Those systems can jam. Those systems can actually pose some risk to passengers because something can fall from them. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're uh, probably not the safest thing in terms of fire, fire uh, uh, resistance. Mm-hmm. So I came up with something really simple that actually dictated the form of a building. So the form of a building, its shape uh, is purely uh, functional. It comes from, uh, you know, composition of functional elements, and it's it's very little of subjective design. And then those huge uh, shafts that are actually exiting and coming all the way to the roof, those are exhausts um, for MAP systems, and they are 
uh, water collectors as well. Ah, uh, yeah, I was here we can see this dome. The dome is vast. It's almost a uh, hundred meters between uh, structural elements. It's supported oh. from a huge ring, structural ring that runs under this spatial truss, which is even uh, structural system of, of an even thickness uh, made out of light materials. And it, it is almost like an artificial sky. Mm -hmm. And that was the goal. Mm -hmm. uh, That's amazing. Here you, can see, here you can see that those are um, fiberglass tubes of nearly 200 millimeters in diameter. Mm -hmm. And they're uh, covered with uh, glass panels with photovoltaic cells in it. So they generate energy. Uh, they shade a little, and they also provide great transparency and space is filled with light. Uh, so there's a section uh, where you can see platforms and timetables, and uh, this is the drawing of station layout where you can mm -hmm. see the systems. Uh, uh, and this is actually interior rendering. So that was the goal. That is departure platforms. You see they're yeah. completely open. Uh, they, they're under... You, you can you can get this feeling of artificial sky. Mm -hmm. You can get this uh, feeling of sunlight that penetrates the building and casts some beautiful shadows. And uh, uh, that is really, in my belief, a celebratory experience yeah. uh, for travel. Wow. Uh, this is the entrance zone, your check-in area where you enter the building, you drop off your luggage. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's automatically handled. It's loaded in inside of that service service block. God, I and then, love that. <laughs> uh, yes, in front. You, uh, thank you. In front, you can see the timetables. Uh, yeah. Each timetable is located a top on top of of specific track of designated track, so people really have no uh, no hustle in fighting their uh, their platform. Uh, they're making sure they get on their their individual pod going to an individual donation or destination huh yes exactly so so these are uh, these are the timetables and uh, hmm. this is actually a view from this leisure area a view towards uh the platforms and at the bottom you can see the pods that are facing inside of the building there mm -hmm. uh, they're located on arrival platforms that's where people leave the pods once they arrive and they uh, proceed to pick up their luggage and leave the building Hmm. So, uh, when I told earlier about integrated design, here you can see, for example, um, a departure platform, a close-up view. Mm -hmm. So, the uh, furniture, for example, this bench that is combined with timetable, is in the same design language as the pod and as the station. So, uh, that was the goal of having this singular experience mm -hmm. uh, uh, that people can really uh, enjoy. Um, that's what they would wow. view before uh, embarking the pod. Hmm. Wow. Uh, these are arrival platforms, and you see these huge cylinders on the left. These are gates uh, 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 that separate um, service block from, from the rest of the station. So the pod on the right, uh, it's pictured with open doors because people just left it. And you can see the human figure on the right. Uh, once people left it, they, the pods are entering the service block and then they're, uh, they're, the, the luggage is handled inside and mm -hmm. all maintenance uh, operations are performed. And in the left bottom corner, you can see what passengers actually experience once they exit the pod. So the goal was in that arrival experience is as much as exciting as departure experience. Mm -hmm. So two stations on the end of, on both ends of, of a route uh, should, you know, be uh, very nice to its visitors. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit of image about the pod so you can see the, uh, the singular design approach. Uh, uh, this is the view of the tracks and actually how platforms are separated in terms of uh, level difference. Uh, so you see each each platform is connected through an escalator to some promenade uh, concourse, whether it's a departure concourse or arrival concourse, mm -hmm. which is later connected to all the facilities, such as luggage pickup and customs uh, security clearance, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, and the last image shows the, the uh, service block, which actually I conceived as an open, uh, as being, uh, you, so passengers would be able to see 
all these operations of parts handling, um, their maintenance, that, that should be exciting as well to see how your uh, how the batteries are changed uh, inside of the pod, how luggage is uh, loaded, uh, whether it's done autonomously or with help of people. I thought that could be another part of spectacle for the building and for the entire experience. It would, it would definitely make um, waiting for your pod go by really quickly. <laughs> that's true. Uh, that's A little bit about parametric model for the roof and its structural system. Wow. So uh, uh, thanks a lot for... Uh, allowing me to show these images. Wow, that was that was really amazing. Thank you, Blake. And the last the last episode would perhaps be mm -hmm. a uh, model demonstration. So um, uh, I really put a lot of time into designing the nose of, of the pod um, mm -hmm. because I wanted for passengers to see this arriving vehicle uh, as something really exciting. So yeah. when they stand on the platform and when they wait for it, uh, they should really like uh, uh, what they see. But not only, uh, this is also a uh, functional consideration. So you can see the blades of this of this uh, uh, compressor mm -hmm. being bulging out a little bit off of the design surface of, of the pot. This mm -hmm. is made to actually capture uh, the boundary flow and evacuate it. That means that Everything that goes to the, the surface drag is minimal. Afterwards, the boundary flow was suctioned, was sucked in uh, into the compressor. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, an innovative concept. It was researched previously by engineers, of course, and I thought that could be uh, um, of use in in the pod. Mm -hmm. A bit of uh, of uh, the uh, side and. Uh, wow. And uh, uh, luggage compartment. And yeah. It's located at the top and it is located outside. Huh. May not need to be uh, pressurized, uh, yeah. but it is done for ease of handling, whether it's an autonomous handling of luggage or uh, manual. Um, so this, I think, that those two operations has to be had to be separated completely. Uh, people embark the pod on the platform, and then luggage is handled. Uh, automatically inside of a uh, service block. Wow. Incredible. Um, just, I'm sorry, how many people can fit in this prototype that I see? Uh, it's uh, 20 people right 20. now. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Um, I, I, do, I mean, that's kind of, so that model that <laughs> you have, that you created, that's I, I want to be able to envision people having a conversation, you know, right next to the person that they're sitting next to or, you know, like, yeah, I mean, like, that's kind of what I wanted this whole uh, interview and this in the loop series to be about. And like, what would people talk about <laughs> when they're traveling uh, so fast? And it's, it's so uh, satisfying to actually see this in person because I've only like seen, you know, one dimensional <laughs> renderings and stuff. Uh, um, great. Uh, yeah. awesome. oh, man. I believe that that's an important part of uh, of a uh, of an experience. You know, uh, I mean, having windows inside of the tube that's mm -hmm. an option as well. It is risky because it, I mean, it poses a lot of uh, risk uh, in term uh, onto the system in mm -hmm. terms of pressurization issues. But uh, I mean, I, I believe it might have been done at some point because mm -hmm. uh, if you run through a, a beautiful landscape you actually uh, want to feel the sense of speed. And the only way you can feel it is when you have some objects uh, against which or in relation to which you can actually perceive the speed. And, uh, you know, uh, when you take a travel speed for the pod and when you calculate how much the pod travels in one second, mm -hmm. uh, you can actually determine the amount of uh, the, the, the distance uh, that should uh, go between each window. So it's almost really? like, like like a frame per second, you know, that cinematic oh, wow. uh, approach. So you really need to have just one window each 12 meters. Uh, uh -huh. And the window can be really small. But when pod is flying, uh, the, the visual experience would be a single uninterrupted image. 
That's incredible. And you and you watch like a mountain, you know, like you're turning around a mountain or going by a mountain or something. That would be so awesome. Yeah, yeah, I uh, I know. Uh, but I mean, um, engineering wise, uh, that, that's that's questionable. But I believe maybe in the distant future, I I just thought that that is much more exciting than the panels uh, than the TV uh, like LED screens that show you some uh, uh, something. A little animation. Um, well, and that's that's kind of you, you bringing up a kind of an actual engineering question of like how do we not have a lot of disunity when you watch and look out the window. That's I've never. It's really fascinating for myself, a non-engineer, to kind of hear an engineering solution on how to space the windows correctly. <laughs> and like, yeah, so yeah. it's it's fascinating. That's the real confluence I think that you specialize in and just making this human. Uh, a human experience. <laughs> yes, but like I said, it, this is questionable because any kind of opening you add to the tube uh, mm. increases the risk of failure. But you know, good. in yeah. the end, in in the end, maybe sometime in the future, the this the system, its 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 design and its manufacturing would come to such a point that this might be done. I don't know. That is just a, uh, you know, uh, just a proposal. Yeah. Well, this has been absolutely mind-blowing uh an experience how can how can people follow you and how can we support you or in, in the future uh, yeah thanks for these questions uh on my website on my twitter it's rb systems rb dash systems dot us mm-hmm. uh, and rb systems on twitter um uh and instagram and facebook please find subscribe i'd be glad to answer questions or collaborate mm-hmm. on the projects Exactly. And there will be a lot of projects. <laughs> this is just so. the beginning. Um, well, thank you so much for taking this time and explaining this amazing, uh, complex and beautiful system. It's been a thank really you. pleasure. Thanks right. for having me. Thanks. Again.